Hey class, welcome back. And today we are going to get into chapter 10 of the textbook. And you'll see by the title, Good Times and Bad in the Pacific Rim Superstate. They're referring to the 1920s as the good times and the 1930s as the bad times as the country sets into the Great Depression in 1929. So we're going to talk about some growth patterns, particularly in Southern California in the early 20th century. That's how we're going to begin. And then we're going to talk about the Great Depression. And we're also we're going to end today by talking about the water infrastructures in the state. So let's begin. So you'll notice there's a lot of key terms here and pretty much all of the key terms that you see there on the left are referring to the 1920s. Um, and then uh, most of the key terms on the right, those are uh, referring to the Great Depression. Um, the only exception to that would be um, the construction of the Los Angeles Aqueduct and the beginning of the construction in the Hetch Hetchy Valley for water for both San Francisco and Los Angeles. So one of the things that's happening in the 1920s is that Los Angeles is really growing significantly. There's a lot of reasons for that. There's the oil industry. There's the fact that railroads now have refrigerated rail cars. And this, of course, allows for agriculture to really explode, particularly citrus. Um, you've got the opening of the port in San Pedro. So you've got all these tanker ships coming in and out of that port. And of course, after 1914, those ships are able to move through the Panama Canal. So commerce is booming. You've got the opening of the Los Angeles Aqueduct that takes place in the 19 teens. And you've got an increase in tourism and manufacturing. By the mid 1920s, as you can see from the slide, the population of Los Angeles is going to grow significantly and surge to over 1 million from just 100,000 at 1900. So you can see that the, the, the city itself has really grown. And we, in this class, um, since the American period, have talked a lot about San Francisco because San Francisco was really the hub of activity because of the gold rush. But as we get into the 20th century, Los Angeles really becomes the city in California for the 20th century. So with all of this population growth, we're gonna see a rapid growth of infrastructure. So you see the, of course, iconic city hall building in downtown Los Angeles opening in 1928 and really bringing in this sense that Los Angeles has really now come to its own. Um, the other thing that Los Angeles had in the early 20th century was the most extensive public transportation system in California. Um, this transportation system was run primarily by trolley cars and they would go all over Los Angeles County and they would go into the surrounding areas as well. So these trolley cars would actually take people all the way out to Pasadena so people could commute on these trolley cars. It was extremely successful. Unfortunately, um, this trolley system will eventually be torn out and Los Angeles will really very much become an automobile city. Um, but in this early period of Los Angeles history, this was an extremely progressive um, uh, aspect of Los Angeles and its infrastructure was this public transportation system primarily run uh, by trolleys. So as I mentioned, you know, automobile culture really becomes uh, huge here in California. And in the 1920s, people across the nation are buying up cars. And they're doing this because cars are cheap and affordable. And you could buy your cars on loans, installment loans. So lots of people were buying cars. The price of cars actually drops from the 19-teens from $850 for a Ford Model T 
to just $250 in the 1920s. So this makes automobile ownership possible for most people. By 1925, Los Angeles had one automobile for every three residents. So as I mentioned, the city is really going to grow up around the automobile, and that's why you have such a vast suburban sprawl surrounding Los Angeles because many people did own automobiles and were able to commute um, fairly long distances um, from their home to their workplace. Um, by 1930, 94% of Los Angeles homes were single family homes. So again, you see this um, building pattern where you have these neighborhoods and these suburbs that are growing up around the city. So here you see an image, of course, of the famous um, iconic Hollywood sign. This sign was put up in 1923, and it's intended to draw people to the area to check out a housing development that was popping up there in the Hollywood Hills. But it really becomes an icon for Southern California for the movie industry, of course, and it draws visitors um, people begin to come to California as tourists. They're also coming to California for various manufacturing opportunities. There were rubber manufacturing plants in Southern California, to, you know, tire companies that were taking rubber from Southeast Asia. There was cotton that was coming in from India and um, being processed in textile plants in Southern California. A Ford auto, auto plant opens up in Southern California, as does a steel plant, a Kaiser steel plant. So people coming to California, not just um, to um, recreate and to visit, but also to live as well. But the iconic Hollywood sign after its construction, again, really becomes this icon for the movie industry. Um, in 1932, for example, an actress decides that she's, you know, she's going through some hard times and she decides to very dramatically take a swan dive off of the H of the Hollywood sign in kind of her last um, hurrah, her last great act, right? So it becomes a sign of the acting world, um, the Hollywood world and the movie industry. But by the 1940s, the Hollywood sign had begun to fall into disrepair um, and then by 1949, a group of citizens decides that it's going to focus on repairing um, the sign and they drop the land and they just focus on the Hollywood part. Um, but again, the automobiles um, allowed for greater mobility. Um, people could travel to different areas of the state now using their car. And then people, of course, arriving um, to the state many of them via the newly opened Highway 66, also sometimes referred to as Route 66. That opened up in 1926. And um, Highway 66 stretched from Chicago, Illinois, all the way to Santa Monica, California. So it brought with it a lot of um, people who wanted to come and visit uh, via the automobile. Los Angeles also comes to be known as one of those places with kind of quirky and unique tourist destinations. Um, exotic animals seem to be of particular interest to a lot of tourists. And so you see a lot of wild animal parks and exotic animal parks opening up. And you can see here, you could get an ostrich ride for, at the ostrich farm up there in the upper left hand corner or down here in the lower right hand corner you could you know dine with alligators <laughs> and so um, lots of different kind of interesting um, tourist attractions popping up all over the state but especially here um, in Southern California where tourists flocked for the warm weather. And of course, the famous Southern California beaches, right? And we see here some very crowded uh, beach um, that's off of the Venice uh, area in 1920. And you'll also notice the sand. 
Um, so the beaches in Southern California today are actually heavily managed and sand is brought in to uh, replace the sand that is washed away on a regular basis. So you don't see the big broad beaches um, in these early photographs that you see today. Um, and that's because our beaches are really, like I said, managed. Um, but you can see here that the beaches were very popular. People flocked to the beaches for recreation. There were lots of different um, amusement parks along the coast of Southern California um, that opened up so that people would come to enjoy the carnival rides and things like that. Also, public swimming was very popular. Um, both indoor and outdoor swimming facilities, um, which were often referred to as bathhouses, if they were the indoor variety, uh, were popping up all over the state as well. So here you see images of, again, another tourist, a uh, popular tourist destination. This was the Mount Lowell Tram. And this tram existed from 1893 to 1938. And this was a tram that could be, um, you could get to the tram via the trolley system. It would take you to the base of the San Gabriel Mountains. And then you could get on the Mount Lowell tram and the tram would take you up this very rickety, kind of scary looking track um, to the top of Mount Lowell where you would be able to dine and drink at the Alpine Tavern. So again, just a nice way for Angelinos to spend the weekend or escape the heats of the valley. And here we have uh, the very famous Arcadia Hotel. This was located in Santa Monica. Um, very popular just to stay at, but it also had this roller coaster attached to it where you could have you know, you could swish out to the end of this pier on the roller coaster and swish back to uh, the hotel. So again, just some really like kind of creative, innovative um, forms of entertainment that we don't really see today um, existed back in, in the early 20th century and late 19th century. So as I mentioned before, when I was talking about the beaches, there was also amusement parks here in Southern California that no longer actually exist. Um, we had one in Venice, California called Ocean Parkland. Um, and you can see actually an image of it right up there in the upper right hand corner. That's the roller coaster at Ocean Parkland. And you can see that it's right um, next to the canals. And Venice was a community that was built, of course, to replicate the canals of Venice, Italy. Um, and there was a housing development that grew up around it. But then you also had Ocean Parkland, which was this big amusement park that drew a bunch of visitors and tourists and things like that. Um, today, we only have the Santa Monica Pier. That's the last remaining amusement area um, here in Los An in the Los Angeles area anyway. Um, but um, back then there was Ocean Parkland in Venice and then there was uh, Pikes Park in Long Beach, which you see an image of in those in the um, lower right hand corner there. Um, so again, this is bringing tourism. Um, it allows for working class people to have a place to go and recreate. Keep in mind that for a lot of people, you know, you worked six days a week, you may only have one day a week off. So it was really nice for working class families to have places to go and have a good time and, and be able to, you know, maybe afford to go on a couple of rides or have an ice cream or whatever. So if you click on this link right here, it'll take you to a documentary that talks about these amusements. It's kind of a fun link because you get to see actual moving images of some of these amusements that they had back in the early 20th century in Los Angeles. So to give you an example of this growing economic pattern and the growth of infrastructure, um, in 1916, 
there was 784 miles of concrete roads um, in California. And by 1930, there will be 2,171 miles of roads throughout the state. Um, what we see happening in the 1920s is really the foundation for both Highway 1, which is our famous coastal highway here in California, and also Interstate 5, although, of course, the interstate system does not get established until the 1950s, but we're going to see the beginnings of where Interstate 5 will be located. We're going to start to see roads built along there. Then you have the Bayshore Highway, which is going to be the first three-lane highway built from 1924 to 1932 um, from San Francisco to San Jose. So it was meant to connect those two cities. San Francisco, of course, was a much larger city than San Jose at the time. But um, this will become the Highway 101. Um, this, uh, the first freeway, uh, modeled after the German Autobahn, which was multi-lane, divided, controlled access uh, freeway, was the Pasadena Freeway, and that was completed in 1940. Um, so you're starting to see these uh, more efficient infrastructures that are being built. Um, bridges are also being built. The Bay Bridge, which will open in 1936, at the time was the largest bridge ever built, and that will connect Oakland, California, with San Francisco, California. Prior to this, if you wanted to commute back and forth between those two cities, you were taking a ferry. Um, and then, of course, the Golden Gate Bridge, um, which opens a year after the Bay Bridge in 1937. And this will um, have the distinction of being the tallest and longest uh, suspension bridge. And then, of course, um, water management, which of course we're going to talk in much greater detail about later when I talk about the various water uh, management systems that were put in place. But one of the biggest ones is the Boulder Dam, later on known as the Hoover Dam, which will um, dam the Colorado River which allows then for these Western states, not just California, um, but um, for Western states generally to have access to this massive amount of, rip, of river water um, that comes from the, uh, the Boulder Dam, which was later on named uh, the Hoover Dam. Uh, it was built in Boulder Ca Canyon in Nevada um, Hiram Johnson had actually advocated for it throughout the 1920s, but it won't be completed until 1935, and it provides not just flood control, but also irrigation and uh, hydroelectric power. It was um, considered a massive engineering feat um, and will later on basically come... Um, be part of what comes to be known as the Colorado River Compact. And this is where seven states um, along the Colorado River decide to divide up the water resources from the river. Uh, California, of course, is one of those states. So it becomes a very important piece of infrastructure for our state, particularly when it comes to irrigation water for the Imperial Valley. So here you have a map of the state highway system. As I mentioned on the last slide, um, this is a system that will comprise by 1930, 2,171 miles of highway. So that's quite extensive. And you'll also notice that um, this highway system also extends into some of the more remote parts of the state, right? Over here in these eastern areas of the state, um, up here in these more um, remote areas of Northern California. So um, it is quite extensive and it does give uh, Californians access to these wildlands in areas of the state.
um, to go and recreate, to enjoy the parks, et cetera. And um, what's funding this? Mostly gas taxes and bond measures that were passed by the state legislature. So here you see an image of the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge. And the Golden Gate Bridge was an idea that had been promoted since the 1920s by an engineer by the name of Joseph Strauss. And there was a whole lot of challenges involved in building this bridge. Um, the first being um, getting the money to build it. There was a lot of resistance to it. A lot of people thought that it wasn't, um, in, it, it could not be um, sound engineering, right? Um, the Golden Gate Strait, um, which it would be uh, built across, was considered uh, very dangerous. There were lots of currents. Um, there was a lot of resistance by ferry operators who were making a lot of money ferrying people from one side of the Bay Area to the other. Um, so there was a lot of opposition, but in 1930, um, Joseph Strauss was able to secure a $33 million bond to begin construction. And construction of the Golden Gate Bridge will begin in 1933, and it will end in 1937. It is considered a major engineering feat. Um, it was the longest suspension bridge at 4,200 feet long. And it was, of course, named after the strait that it connected, which is the Golden Gate Strait. So um, when it opened up in 1937, it was a huge event. 200,000 uh, people will actually show up for the grand opening of the Golden Gate Bridge. And um, the toll, the original toll um, to cross the bridge was 50 cents each way. Um, it was, like I said, a major engineering feat, but remarkably, only 11 lives were lost in construction of this bridge, which is quite remarkable considering um, the challenges and the environmental hazards in constructing this bridge, um, namely the weather. Um, 11 people will die, 10 of them on the same day. There were actually um, all standing on the same scaffolding and the scaffolding broke and they, they fell to their dust. Um, but as I mentioned, this was a huge engineering endeavor. It was highly celebrated when the, when the uh, bridge opened in 1937. And keep in mind that this is all happening within the context of the Great Depression um, because the Great Depression breaks out in 1929. So this was a a way for people to also have jobs in the Bay Area on these major construction projects of not just the Golden Gate Bridge, but also the Bay Bridge. So here again, you can see the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge in this image, and you see these big suspension spans being built. And again, another image showing the um, building and its progress. So if you click on the YouTube link, you can learn more about the construction of both the Bay Bridge and the Golden Gate Bridge. Okay, another major thing that's happening in uh, California of course, is the establishment of the movie industry. Um, by 1914, Hollywood will become the center of movie making in the nation. And you have the establishment of all of these major studios, MGM in 1924, R RKO in 1928, Warner Brothers in 1929, 20th Century Fox in 1935, and Paramount also in 1935. Now, the first um, studio will open in Hollywood in 1911, and basically what, you're, what you get, um, I, and you'll learn more about that if you click on this link, is uh, Jewish investors, Jewish movie producers 
that had moved out from uh, from New Jersey, from New York, um, in order to have an opportunity to create movies in California. In New York and New Jersey, um, the movie industry was dominated by Edison Studios. And so this group of predominantly Jewish movie producers decide that they want to break away from Edison. Edison was a very shrewd um, and calculating businessman, and he didn't like competition. So he essentially drove them out. But it turns out that the movie industry in California will be much more successful than it was in New York. And part of that, of course, had to do with the fact that California had so many diverse environments that lended itself well to different movie sets. So you could have a movie set um, filmed in the desert. You could have one filmed at the beach. You could have one in the ocean, uh, you know, at the beat of, uh, excuse me, in the mountains, um, in the woods, right? So you have all of these little different micro um, environments. And of course, the sunshine, the weather is generally sunny and mild in California, in most parts of California. And so this also allowed for these movie studios to be able to um, really take advantage of this, um, of these environments. All right, here you see the famous Grauman's Theater that was co-owned by Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks. Opens up in 1927 in Los Angeles to much fanfare. Of course, this is the famous theater that will host the Academy Awards multiple times. Um, the first Academy Award will be held in 1929. And, uh, and, and basically, this also becomes a Hollywood iconic spot because this is where the stars will come to put their imprints in the sidewalk. So um, this is, uh, again, an example of how 1920s uh, Los Angeles is really becoming one of those world-class cities that will heavily influence popular culture. So not everything in the 1920s was great. Um, certainly there was a lot of prosperity um, and there was a, some, a certain degree of economic growth. But there was also major divisions that took place um, in American culture in the 1920s. And what we start to see in the 1920s is a real backlash against some of the modernizing forces um, in the nation at the time. And so you get a resurgence of, for example, um, uh, the Ku Klux Klan, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. You begin to see uh, the development of evangelical Christianity, um, which is actually very influential in Southern California with evangelical preachers like Amy Semple McPherson who has a radio program in which she preaches these event Christian evangelical ideas. And um, your textbook talks about her. And you see a lot of um, changes culturally after World War I as we get into the 1920s. You saw demographic shifts during World War I when African Americans um, left the South in large numbers to come to um, uh, the uh, more northern um, states. Um, and so, and also during World War and after World War I, for California in particular, um, increase in African American populations don't really happen in California significantly until World War II. But what does increase in the 19 teens and 1920s is the Mexican population in California. So you are going to see a backlash against that. Also in the 1920s is the era of prohibition. So we're going to talk about how that's going to impact the state as well. So let's get started. So as I mentioned, um, there was a resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan uh, nationally in the 1920s. And it kind of begins with this film that was filmed in California called The Birth of a Nation. This is a 
this is the uh, first feature length film in uh, filmed in uh, Hollywood. And the subject of the film is the Civil War and then the aftermath of the Civil War. And what makes this film strange is that it really celebrates the Ku Klux Klan as being kind of the savior of the South after the Civil War. And so a lot of historians kind of credit um, Birth of a Nation as a film because it was hugely popular as kind of normalizing this idea of uh, the Ku Klux Klan. But then also the Ku Klux Klan gets taken over by a very sort of shrewd, um, politically minded, uh, what they called Grand Wizard, a man by the name of Hiram Evans. And he decides that he's going to move the Ku Klux Klan headquarters to Washington, D.C. in the 1920s and in the 1930s. And this is important because the Ku Klux Klan's uh, membership is going to grow significantly and also that the Ku Klux Klan is going to have a direct influence on American politics. So you start to see anti-immigrant legislation, for example, getting passed by Congress during this time period. The Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s is not just focusing its hate on African Americans as it did back in the 19th century primarily, but it's also focusing on Jewish populations, Catholic populations, immigrant populations, and any kind of political radical. So what you're seeing here is an image of Ku Klux Klan members marching in Washington, D.C. in 1925. It's estimated that the national membership of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s was somewhere around 4 million. So this was happening all over the country. Their, their slogan at the time was native, meaning born in the U.S., white and Protestant. And if you didn't fall into those categories, then you were subject to discrimination by the Ku Klux Klan. Now, I do not want to give the impression that the Ku Klux Klan was active only in other parts of the country. In fact, the Ku Klux Klan was very active here in the state of California, where it carried out um, acts of violence against immigrants and during prohibition against bootleggers. Um, the violence that was committed by the Ku Klux Klan in California included lynchings, um, tarring and feathering of people. There was a lot of threats against uh, minority populations. For example, there would often be Ku Klux Klan in California was notorious for calling uh, African-American organizations and threatening them. Uh, any kind of a Jewish population could be a target. Catholics um, who moved into white areas would sometimes be threatened um, over the phone. Um, there were these housing covenants that were formed in California, and housing covenants are basically where you have neighborhoods that agree that on the title to their house, it would say that you could not sell that house to a minority. And it, the whole um, effort behind it was to keep that um, neighborhood white. Um, and so there was a lot of discrimination here in California. It got so bad, actually, in California, and particularly in Southern California, that Los Angeles City Council had to pass a law making it illegal to wear a mask unless it was Halloween because Ku Klux Klan members were going around Los Angeles terrorizing uh, minority populations, again, targeting Catholics, um, Jewish people, Mexican people, and African Americans particularly. But any minority population would have been targets for Klan violence. One of the biggest targets of, of, of uh, racial discrimination in California was the Mexican immigrant population, which in the 1920s was growing significantly. 
I talked about in the last lecture, the Mexican Revolution, and this is a real push factor for a lot of people to immigrate to the United States because of the violence of the revolution. But also in the 1920s, um, the United States actually made it relatively easy for Mexican immigrants to come into the country. This is because of the growing agricultural industry in not just California, but throughout the Southwest, um, places like Texas and places like Arizona and New Mexico. And so um, it was, you know, if you came to the border, um, you would undergo a literacy and health exam. And the literacy tests um, were part of a 1917 immigration law. And you basically had to be able to read a page in your native language. Um, so they, they weren't um, seeing whether or not you were literate in English, but they wanted to see that you were literate generally. And then there would be a quick health exam. Again, this was also part of the 1917 immigration law. Um, and then you would have to pay a, a fee in order to get into the US. It was $18 at the time and $8 for each additional person. So if you came in as a family unit, this was quite expensive because uh, if you think about it back then, you're talking about um, a dollar being equivalent to somewhere around $19 in today's money. So you would have had to have quite a savings in order to be able to make this border crossing. But about a half a million Mexicans will enter the U.S. in this way in the 1920s. So that by the time we get to the 1930s, you're really going to have a pretty significant uh, Mexican population um, in the United States. And this was based on the immigration from the 19-teens, from the 1920s, and then also from natural growth because a lot of these Mexican immigrant families are having children. All right, so now we're going to turn to talking about the 18th Amendment, the era of prohibition in the United States, and the Volstead Act. And the Volstead Act is the act of Congress that specifies, outlines the ways in which the 18th Amendment will be enforced. So what is the 18th Amendment? The 18th Amendment is a U.S. A constitutional amendment that outlaws the manufacture, transportation, and sale of alcohol in the United States. Now, it, um, this is also known as the Prohibition Era, and you can see that the dates for the Prohibition Era are from 1920 to 1933. You'll notice that the Act actually does not prohibit consumption of alcohol, but because the manufacture, transportation, and sale of alcohol was illegal, it made it very difficult for people to access alcohol unless they made it themselves. Um, at first, this has a lot widespread support. Obviously, it wouldn't have passed as a constitutional amendment if it didn't have widespread support. But by the late 1920s, it's going to become very unpopular throughout the country for a number of reasons, some of them cultural reasons, some of them economic reasons. But let's talk about how prohibition is going to impact California specifically. So in California, the um, reaction to prohibition was very much mixed, and it really depended upon where you lived. In certain parts of the state, particularly in more rural parts of the state and remote parts of the state, law enforcement will just ignore prohibition completely. Um, keep in mind that a lot of law enforcement officials wanted to drink themselves, and so they didn't necessarily believe in this particular law. And you could get away with ignoring this law if you lived in remote areas. The big industry in California that this is going to impact is the wine growing industry. Um, this is, of course, an industry that had existed in California since the 19th century, and it was just kind of getting up off of its feet when this prohibition goes into effect. So they are going to have to find 
clever ways to kind of circumvent um, the fact that they can no longer sell wine. One of the most popular ways to do this was to sell what were called wine bricks. Um, and this was something that basically allowed, uh, basically gave people a wine making kit. Um, it was a, a brick of grapes and then it would give instructions that began with do not add yeast, sugar, and leave in the cupboard for 20 days or this wine or this grape brick might turn into wine, right? So the idea being that you could still get away with um, selling wine in this fashion. You could also, of course, just grow grapes to consume, but typically wine grapes are different varieties than the type that we think of for table grapes. Um, wineries were able to sell to churches, so they did still remain uh, somewhat operational, but again, they were um, scaled back considerably. If, as far as California, a lot of the smuggling of alcohol that came into California came from Canada. And so you had these boats that would be stationed off of the territorial water. So territory, the, the laws of the United States only went as far as the territorial water. And so the territorial water off the shores of California during the 1920s was three nautical miles, um, which is about uh, 6,076 feet is a nautical mile. So three of those um, off of the shore. And then past that, you could actually have boats um, stationed out there and then you could send these little skiffs in um, with smuggled alcohol. And that's exactly what happened in places like Sausalito in the San Francisco Bay. There was a lot of rum runners that would come from Canada and they would, you know, offload onto these smaller ships and then they would come into the San Francisco Bay and secretly unload there. Other places where this was happening was in places like uh, Catalina, where they were just outside of the nautical miles of the territorial waters. And so they were able to get along, uh, get away with having gambling operations out there and having those areas where you could launch off uh, these smuggling boats to bring alcohol um, to the shores of California. So people, you know, found ways around this. Of course, there was also the speakeasies these secret saloons where people would go to um, enjoy alcohol in a public place. They were basically secret bars. And the reason why they were called speakeasies is because you had to know a secret knock or a secret um, passcode to get into them. And once you were in, you could, um, it was just like a bar. So you could go up to the bar, you could order some alcohol, maybe you could enjoy some live music, etc. So these speakeasies were typically located in secret hidden locations, sometimes at the backs of businesses. Barber shops were particularly um, in, you know, infamous for having speakeasies um, behind them. They were sometimes located in basements of businesses. Um, but again, people found ways around this law but of all the industries in California, probably the one that it's going to impact the hardest will be that winemaking industry, which again, will be able to find ways around it. Um, if you click on this video link, you will learn more about uh, the 18th Amendment and specifically the 18th Amendment in California. So now we're going to turn to talking about California and the Great Depression. The Great Depression breaks out in nationally in 1929 with the crash of the stock market in October of 1929. And it really lasts through the entire decade of the 1930s. Unemployment in across the nation averaged during the Great Depression um, somewhere around 25 percent. But in certain parts of the country, um, that number was much higher. So for example, certain times during the 1930s, uh, unemployment in Los Angeles reaches high somewhere around 60%. Um, California uh, 
uh, changes, transforms as a result of the Great Depression. First off, we get a big migration of people that come into the state from the Dust Bowl regions. These are known as the Okies and the Arkies, and they came here as basically refugees from this horrific um, environmental catastrophe that took place on the Southern Plains. We'll talk about them. The other way that the Great Depression is going to impact California is the deportation of Mexicans. It's estimated that somewhere around a fifth of California's Mexican population was uh, deported during um, the Great Depression. The other thing is um, California politicians are going to lead the way in coming up with creative solutions to uh, the problems of the Great Depression. And then another thing that happens during the 1930s in California is protests and labor protests, particularly, particularly amongst agricultural workers um, who were really in many ways feeling a huge brunt from um, the Great Depression because they did not have access to a lot of the programs that the federal government was uh, putting out in order to mitigate the impact of the Depression. So lots of things were happening in California during the 1930s, and that's what we're going to take a look at next. All right, so in response to the Great Depression, in 1932, Californians supported the nomination and election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the presidential candidate for the Democratic Party. And he had promised uh, the country a new deal for the American people, um, basing, you know, federally funded programs on helping relieve the pain that had been caused by the economic downturn of the Great Depression. Um, his opposition candidate was Herbert Hoover, who had already been president for four years and had really done uh, not enough to address the issues of the um, the suffering nation. But on a state level, there was a gubernatorial race um, at that very same year in 1932. And Upton Sinclair, the famous author who had written The Jungle, which exposed the horrors of the meatpacking industry, he had once been, he decides to run as the Democratic candidate on the gubernatorial ticket uh, in 1932 for the state of California, he had once been a socialist and really still had a lot of the socialist type ideals. And he writes a pamphlet um, called I, Governor of California and How I Ended Poverty. And in this pamphlet, he portrays how California will be able to uplift itself out of the Great Depression. This comes to be known as the EPIC campaign in poverty in California. So he has this very sort of socialist vision for the future. He talks about farmlands and factories that were publicly owned. He talks about these cooperatives for agricultural and industrial manufacturing, and it's it's appealing, but it's not nearly um, as, as strong of a message as his opponent, his Republican opponent, Frank Merriam, is going to promote, which is that uh, Upton Sinclair was somehow outside of America's mainstream, that he was too radical, that he was into free love and other types of strange things as far as they were concerned, that he was an atheist, which could make him potentially a communist sympathizer. So Upton Sinclair, although he runs for president, in, or excuse me, for governor in 1932, he will uh, not win. He will be uh, won out by Frank Merriam, who is the Republican candidate. Upton Sinclair also failed to get the endorsement of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Had he had that, he might have done better in the gubernatorial election. He also was hurt by the fact that he did not support a Long Beach physician's uh, idea, a man by the name of Francis Townsend, for an old age pension. So that's what we're going to talk about next. But I wanted to give a shout out to Upton Sinclair because he is an example of how California politicians 
were trying to address the issues of the Great Depression in creative ways by implementing these cooperatives, by having workers work together for a common goal. Okay, so now another creative thinker in the 1930s, Francis, Town Francis Townsend, again a physician from Long Beach, comes up with something called the Townsend Plan. Um, and this is an idea to give a $200 a month pension to every retired citizen over the age of 60. This becomes wildly popular. Part of the caveat of the plan was that you had to spend that money within the month. So otherwise you lost it. So you gave you know everybody $200, but they had to go out and spend it. And this, the idea behind it is, well, A, you're helping people who are retired and don't have any other source of income, but B, you are also stimulating the economy by forcing people to go out and spend this money. Million, uh, 1.5 million people um, nationwide supported this idea and it becomes extremely popular and gains the attention of the federal government who will eventually pass the Social Security Act of 1935, which implements a, an old age pension for people throughout the country. And the Social Security Act is one of those New Deal pieces of legislation that still exists today. So here you have this California politician, again, or, or actually more like a political activist who is out there promoting this idea and uh, eventually will capture the imagination of the federal government, which will influence the passage of the Social Security Act. So again, another important um, contribution of the uh, California to the Great Depression and the New Deal generally. Okay, during the 1930s, an ecological disaster in the Southern Plains of the United States will bring over a million migrants to California. What you're seeing here in this image is a picture of a dust storm. And in places of Oklahoma and Texas, Colorado, New Mexico, um, there were these massive dust storms that emerged on the landscape in the 1930s as a result of drought and bad farming practices. And this will drive, uh, like I said, over a million people out of this region. Um, because, of course, they were suffering from this environmental catastrophe, but they were also suffering from the impact of the Great Depression as well. So you can see here on this map, this is the region that was most heavily impacted by the um, dust storms over here in places like Kansas, again, Oklahoma, Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas. Um, and then this also lies along the route of Route 66. So a lot of the people that were suffering in this area got in their cars and they packed up everything and they traveled Route 66 to California. Why were they coming to California? Well, they were coming to California because California was known as an agricultural state. And that's what these folks knew how to do. The problem, of course, was that California was already dealing with a lot of problems related to the Great Depression. And so they met, um, these migrants met with a lot of hostility once they got to the state. Um, this, kind, this experience of these migrant populations was memorialized in John Steinbeck's 1939 novel, The Grapes of Wrath, which won John Steinbeck, a California author, a Pulitzer Prize. And um, basically what it does is it talks about um, the, the trials and tribulations of these Okies um, in this Depression era California. They also made a, a famous movie about it as well. So here you're seeing um, a very famous photograph um, that was titled Migrant Mother. This photograph was taken by a um, Depression era photographer who worked for the federal government WPA program, a woman by the name of Dorothea Lang. And this again, this shows 
um, the uh, expression of a woman, a woman by the name of Florence Owens, who was one of these Okies. Um, she had left her home in the Southern Plains with seven children. She had been recently widowed and she came to California to try to find work. And a lot of these agricultural workers are not going to be successful in finding any type of stable work. Um, and many of them are gonna you know, suffer extreme hardships. And later on, actually a reporter came and interviewed um, Florence Owens and asked her how she managed through the Great Depression. And she said that her and her children suffered the entire time, that there was never any uh, relief for them and they never saw any of the relief programs benefiting them. So it's important to know that during the Great Depression, even though the federal government was responding and even the state government to a certain extent to the needs of people, um, there were a lot of people who were left out. So here you see an image of a woman along the side of the road, obviously with all the belongings um, uh, it, you know, packed in the car and they are on their way to California. All right, so the other thing that is going to happen during the Great Depression in the 1930s were these mass deportations of Mexicans, um, most of them, it turns out, American citizens that took place. Altogether, the numbers are staggering. About 1.8 million Mexicans were taken from the U.S. during the Great Depression and quote-unquote repatriated in Mexico. This is because massive amounts of discrimination against Mexicans were taking place as Mexicans were seen as a threat to American jobs during the Great Depression. There were some financial incentives that were put in place for people that did take advantage of or uh, chose to um, participate in these deportations. But generally, this is seen as um, something that was a very discriminatory action carried out by government. And it's estimated that 60% of the population that did get deported were American citizens. If you click on this um, link up here, it will take you to an NPR story, National Public Radio. Um, it's not very long, but it's very informative in summarizing um, what this period of time was like uh, for Mexican Americans during the 1930s. And keep in mind that in the 19 teens and the 1920s, there had been this um, big uh, immigration by Mexicans into the United States for job opportunities, and they were allowed to come and in some cases um, encouraged to come. On top of that, they had also, Mexicans had experienced a cultural revival similar to the Harlem Renaissance that was happening in New York in Los Angeles, uh, where Mexican populations were integrating um, to a certain extent into American culture and participating in the cultural transformations taking place in the 1920s, like the flapper girl movement or going to the speakeasies or the dance halls. And so for a lot of people, particularly those young people who had really begun to acculturate to American life, this was an extremely painful experience. Okay, so now we're gonna to turn to talking about the water challenges in the West. This is a huge part of California history because water management becomes so important in the state. And it has a major impact on our environment and it's something that we are still um, dealing with to this day, right? Of course, because the um, state goes through periods of drought and drought has become more frequent because of climate change. So I want to back up a little bit. I know that in this chapter, your um, chapter does talk about the Central Valley Water Project and also known as the California Aqueduct. And I'm going to show you a map of that in a minute. But all of this really begins with a National Reclamation Act, Reclamation Act that's passed in 1902. 
and this is also known as the Newlands Act, and this is a federal money. This is a act of Congress where it provides federal money to set aside to develop water projects in the West because in the early 20th century, as more people begin to move into these Western states, it becomes very clear that water management is going to be an integral part of a successful business and population um, in the West. So what we're going to see is massive damming projects and water diversion projects. And so by the time we get to today, um, there are very few riverways, especially the major riverways, that are not dammed in the West. And of course, California is no exception to that rule. So what you see over here is a map of the Central Valley, also known as the San Joaquin Valley. And it's a map of the riverways um, as they once were when they flowed, uh, when they flowed, you know, freely. And uh, you'll notice that there's a lot of rivers and you have this delta, this delta up here is known as the San, uh, Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. And it connects the San Francisco Bay, which is right here, with um, these Central Valley areas. And this is how um, people used to be able to take river boats to Stockton and Sacramento for the gold rush, right? Here's, here's Stockton right here. And then you see all of these other rivers and they're coming down from the Sierra Nevada and they, you know, provide, of course, tons of water for this region. And so what the Central Valley Water Project did that was implemented in the 1930s is it built a series of dams along these major rivers, San Joaquin River, um, the Merced River, uh, the Kern River, all of these rivers will, Kings River, all of these rivers will be dammed and water will be diverted to irrigation canals throughout the Central Valley. And that all happens in the 1930s within the context of the Great Depression. But I'm going to back up now and talk about some of the earlier water projects in the state and particularly the water projects that are focused on feeding the big cities of the state, San Francisco and Los Angeles. So I'm going to begin by talking about the Los Angeles Aqueduct Project, uh, and the project will uh, be constructed, the Los Angeles Aqueduct will be constructed over the years of 1907 and completed in 19. Thirteen, The person who is um, thought of as being kind of the brainchild for this project is a man by the name of William Mulholland. He was an Irish immigrant who originally had run away from home as a, as a young kid and joined the British Merchant Navy and then ended up arriving in California in Los Angeles in 1877. So he was one of these early arrivals to California. Uh, back when Los Angeles was really still very much a ranching town. And in that small town, they just had one aqueduct called the Zanja Madre. This was an aqueduct that basically diverted water from the Los Angeles River. And it was enough at the time to feed the relatively small population. But of course, once we get into the 20th century, there's obviously going to be a need for a much better water system to feed the growing population of Los Angeles. So William Mulholland, who becomes the chief engineer of this project, even though he had no formal engineering experience, along with the Los Angeles mayor at the time, a man by the name of Fred Eaton, um, will come up with this plan to divert water all the way from the Owens Valley region to the city of Los Angeles. And um, Fred Eaton actually knew of this place because he had vacationed there as a child. So he knew that there was these big 
uh, uh, lakes out here, specifically the Owens Lake. Um, later on, they try to tap into Mono Lake as well, who, which you see pictured there. And, um, and so he has this idea, why not divert water from this area, which is a very remote area of California, to Los Angeles. And so he and Mulholland go out and start buying up land along the route that they are going to build this uh, aqueduct on. And they need money, so in 1907, they convince the voters of LA to pass a bond measure that will help fund the project, and that's when they are able to start construction. When the project is said and done, and as you can see, it will take six years to complete, the total cost will be about 25 million plus, um, and it will span 238 miles uh, in length. The people of the Owens Valley protested this project. They were not informed ahead of time that water would be taken from their region. And in addition to that, there was also uh, Native Americans that lived in this region as well. So this is going to have a major environmental impact on this area of California. So you can see here, this is the, you can see where the Owens Valley is located in relation to Los Angeles. This is a picture of the Owens River. Um, this is the river that, one of the rivers that had fed into the Owens Lake. Owens Lake will end up drying up as a result of this aqueduct project. And the Los Angeles Aqueduct will look for new sources of water to, in order to continue to provide drinking water for Angelinos as time goes on. But here you have, so you see this very beautiful valley located in these eastern parts of the state. And here is a, an example of the construction um, project and you can see they're using a steam-powered um, shovel to lay this big pipe, and that's essentially what it was. Um, the pipe itself is was, um, or the the elevation change between the Owens Valley and Los Angeles allowed for this aqueduct to be completely gravity-fed. So that means that it was gravity that was moving the water from point A to point B. Here you can see the mule teams that were used to move these heavy pipes. They really had to work in these semi-desert conditions, um, and it was hard to get a lot of this equipment out to these remote areas. Ultimately, the aqueduct will terminate in the San Fernando Valley, where Mulholland and his um, fellow investors had also bought up a bunch of land in order to create an agricultural community in the San Fernando Valley. A lot of this was later revealed and considered a very sort of corrupt thing that Mulholland and his associates did. But at the time that the aqueduct opened, Mulholland gave a very short speech, and you can see people gathered around to celebrate this event. He said, there it is, take it. So if you click on these links, it will actually go into a little bit more detail about um, Mulholland um, and it's sort of the legacy of the Los Angeles aqueduct. As I mentioned, the Los Angeles aqueduct was not a very popular project and it will spur a bunch of uh, very angry and even violent reactions to it. Um, the, the Los Angeles aqueduct has been uh, blown up five times in its existence. The most recent happened in 1976, but in throughout the 1920s, there were various bomb protests set off along the aqueduct and there had to be massive repairs made. So Mulholland, um, again, who was not a um, trained engineer, 
uh, his career will be heavily tarnished despite the fact that he is credited with being the you know, engineer behind the Los Angeles aqueduct. In 1928, um, there was a horrific event that took place. There was a dam burst of the San Francisco Dam, um, and this is located up sort of outside of Santa Clarita. And um, this dam broke and in 1928, but it broke just a day after Mulholland, as in his engineering role, had inspected it. Um, and when the dam broke, um, 400 plus people are going to die by the flood that ensues. And um, the, the dam will leave and the water will leave a 54 mile long swath of uh, destruction that eventually ends up running out to the ocean. But um, this does um, put a major damper on Mulholland's career. And in many ways, he kind of ends up um, dying a very disgraced um, man, but he is, as I said, credited with the Los Angeles Aqueduct Project. So I'm going to move now to talking about um, the Hetch Hetchy Water Project, which was happening um, around the same time as the Los Angeles Aqueduct, but it was made um, to supply water to San Francisco. So one of the consequences of the earthquake of 1906 was um, the realization that Los Angeles, or excuse me, San Francisco did not have enough access to water. And so San Francisco um, engineers began to look for a source of water in the Sierra Nevada, which seems to have an endless supply of water because of all of the snowfall that the mountains get on a regular basis. And they choose as the place, as the potential place to build their dam, a place called the Hetch Hetchy Valley. And um, they begin to actually scout out the valley back in 1901. And it catches the attention of a very, very famous naturalist by the name of John Muir, who at this time was actually a California resident and a frequent visitor to um, the Yosemite Valley. And he had also um, spent a lot of time in the Hetch Hetchy Valley. You'll see here that the Hetch Hetchy Valley, before it was dammed, was, um, it was considered uh, like a mini Yosemite. It had very similar rock foundations with these big granite cliffs. It had waterfalls, which you see here in the background. It had this beautiful river meandering through the valley. Um, so it was considered um, like Yosemite, but it was unlike Yosemite in that it was lesser known. So it was considered this really sort of jewel of um, the Sierra. And John Muir, who again, as I said, had visited the Hetch Hetchy Valley, was very much opposed to the idea of damming the valley. And he set to work to try to fight a very bitter, long, and uh, a political battle over trying to stop this from happening. Uh, he was a co-founder at this time of the Sierra Club, which is still an environmental organization around today, and it was one of the reasons why the Sierra Club was founded. Unfortunately, uh, John Muir is going in the Sierra Club, they're going to lose their battle um, and the water, San Francisco water interest will win. And in 1913, Woodrow Wilson signs the Raker Act. And the Raker Act will basically supply uh, some federal funding to help the building of the Oshananesi Dam, which basically holds back the water in the Hetch Hetchy Valley. And by the time we get to 1934, the project will be completed. Um, of course, it needed time to fill up the reservoir, so that's why it took that amount of time. But basically what happens is after the dam is built, this entire valley will be flooded by this reservoir, which will then start supplying water to San Francisco in 1934. So here you see an image of the Hetch Hetchy Valley after it has been dammed and flooded. And you can see that a lot of its original 
landscape features have uh, been lost. It, the Hetch Hetchy Valley and the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir um, still to this day supply water to San Francisco. And the same is, can be said for the Los Angeles Aqueduct, although the Los Angeles Aqueduct is now not the only source of water for Los Angeles. Los Angeles also gets water from the California Aqueduct Project, which was the project that dammed a bunch of the rivers in the Central Valley and now brings water to Southern California. Um, Los Angeles also gets its water from the Colorado River. So there's a Colorado River aqueduct that actually runs um, underground through um, the northern part of the Coachella Valley um, and does supply actually the Coachella Valley with some water um, via Whitewater Canyon. Um, Whitewater, uh, uh, in the Whitewater Canyon, there is a valve that occasionally will be opened where Colorado River water will spill into Whitewater and that allows for our groundwater to be replenished. So everybody in the state is getting water or benefiting from these water infrastructure projects. Um, but obviously they, they, they come at a great cost, right? Um, you have a loss of habitat for a lot of wildlife um, and, and it causes a lot of issues for um, in the environment. So um, keep that in mind moving forward. Um, water continues to be a major issue in our state. And this is all I have uh, for this lecture. Have a good one and I'll see you later.